tonight. And tonight we have, and thank you whoever set up the, um, the taping. We're gonna, t oh, I meant to ask you, John, is it okay if we tape your presentation? Sure, it's perfectly fine, thank you. Great. Okay, so we have an exciting presentation from the man I just said hi to, which is John Greger. And his presentation is gonna primarily be on landscape photography. And as well as a landscape photographer and educator, uh, John's passions are nature, landscape, and travel photography. Though so he has in his long back history, also a documentary photographer. Uh, he is a big advocate of conservation and has worked for and donated to several conservation organizations. He is also an author of a number of books, including some on wildflowers and horticulture. And if I got any of that wrong, John, please tell me. And he has lived for 40 years of his life as a photographer in Northern Minnesota. But more recently, he's splitting his time between Minnesota and Mexico and travel. And I will let John tell you more about his work and his inspirations when he gets introduced. So our procedure tonight will be the usual, which is when John's presentation begins, we'll turn off everyone's sound so we don't accidentally hear any uncensored conversations or TVs. And we would appreciate if you would all turn off your video, which can also be a distraction. If you have any questions for John, please put them in the chat. If they would best be answered during the presentation, John will address them during a pause. And he says there's a number of pauses during his presentation. Otherwise, he will answer the questions at the end of the presentation during our question and answer time. To introduce him, Noah Buchanan from Hunt's Photo and Video is here tonight. And hopefully he can uncheck his mute. Are you there, Noah? Hello, Noah. Uh, Nancy, I don't think he's on. Oh, I thought I saw him. I thought I did. Well, we can just go on and he can talk later at the end of the presentation if he wants then. So if that's the case, but one, well, I just wanted to say from Hunt's photo, our contacts with the present presenters we've had for this year and the coming year are because of Hunt's photo and video. And they have this amazing contact list of all these different people that present uh, wonderful photography oriented presentations. And we want to say thank you for their help. And all of the, they also give us discounts. So keep an eye out. We sometimes send out in our emails uh, links to their websites and some of the special discounts they'll give us. So without further ado, then I am going to introduce and turn over the evening to John Fragger. There you go, John. Thank you, Nancy. I want to thank uh, uh, Hunt's Photo too for arranging this talk. I've been working with uh, Hunt's Photo for a number of years, uh, and it's a it's a great relationship. Uh, I love the follow up uh, with them. Um, they have come through every single time. And I've referred a lot of students to them, and I've never heard a student come back and say that they had a, a bad experience. So I, speak, I think that speaks volumes about their integrity. I want to thank uh, uh, Mary and Nancy and the uh, Audubon Photography Club for asking me to do this presentation. So thanks a lot. Um, I, I do need to correct one thing. I'm not an author of uh, books relating to uh, nature. I've been a photographer for them. Uh -huh. Although the, the, the wildflower book, I was more than just a photographer. Basically, I re-edited that book. So I do uh, uh, feel a special affinity for that book because that they gave me a very raw transcript that was written a number of years before. And the woman was, uh, she was a, it was a husband and wife team the wife that was still alive and she was quite elderly and they told her they wanted all the editorial changes on that manuscript done on a computer and she had never worked on a computer before mm. in her life and so the concept of cutting and pasting text and moving it around just was very difficult to explain to an 80 plus year old woman um, so I ended up just doing the 
all the re-edit of the book myself. But wow. I'm not an I'm not an author, but a photographer. Okay, well, thanks. Sure. Um, and I what I would do as far as uh, how I would explain myself um, as a photographer. It, it, Probably first and foremost, I am a landscape nature photographer uh, and who has now become uh, enthralled with travel and going back to my more roots of social documentary. But mixed into that is a love also for photographing birds. You're not going to see very many birds in, excuse me, in tonight's presentation. I think there's one or two birds in the whole presentation. But um, I would say, first and foremost, I'm a landscape photographer. Somewhere in there, I'm a bird photographer. I love photographing birds, certainly not a birder. Uh, and I lean heavily on the apps to ID. So uh, I, I'm not that, but I do love photographing birds. They're a lot of fun. Tonight, I'm going to talk about um, landscape composition and technique. Um, so what I'm going to go through, let's see, I got to, uh, just a second here. And you should see one slide. Is that correct? Nancy, we've got the slides up. The screen share is working. Yeah. It looks like we have one. It says introduction equipment mm -hmm. approach to. All right. Good. I'm good. Yep. So, okay. uh, we're going to start. Um, these are the topics. These are sort of the headers that I'm going to go through uh, in the talk. I'm going to do a little introduction, short introduction about um, myself and my work. I'm going to talk about the equipment. I'm going to talk about my approach to the medium, uh, which I think is important to kind of put out there so you know the perspective of where I'm coming from. I'm going to talk about my camera technique. I'm going to talk about using, comp uh, using filters, composition, and then uh, what I call creating a sense of place. So uh, I, I grew up in Minnesota. I spent most of my life in Minnesota and the last 20 some years in Northern Minnesota. This is my studio that's uh, north of Duluth. It's up along the North shore of Lake Superior. Uh, actually I'm off the shore. I'm back off the shore a few miles in the woods. Um, that's probably a pretty fair representation of what it looks like these days. <laughs> for the last five years, I wouldn't know because for the last five years, I haven't been there in the winter. I had south. Uh, I spent over 60 years uh, in Minnesota winters. And um, I've gotten to the point where, you know, I don't, I've spent plenty of time up there in the wintertime. I don't need any more winter photographs, but that's my studio. I do rent it out as an Airbnb. Uh, when uh, I've got a guy that, that manages it for me when I'm traveling, uh, I block it out for a number of workshops that I teach there. Uh, in uh, I'm I'm only in Minnesota actually uh, only about three months out of the year anymore. It's the best three months. I tend to be there in um, sort of end of July, August, September, and the first part of uh, of October. That's the time I spend there. I have a studio area. I teach uh, printmaking workshops as well as regular photography workshops up there. This was one that I did uh, in the winter before I quit uh, uh, teaching there in the winter time. <clears throat> and now I've moved south. This is a group that I just got done teaching uh, about two weeks ago in Mexico City for a, a art organization, a photography center in Mexico City and um, teaching a, a pretty technical subject in a non-native language. I had a very good interpreter, so that's how I was able to do that. But we had about 20 uh, students in this class. It was, it was quite a sizable class. It was a great experience. I had a lot of fun working, uh, working with them. As far as equipment that I use, um, mostly these days what I'm shooting with is the Fuji system. I shoot, I have a Fuji X-T3, X-T4. Um, I, I will pick up the X-T5, which is their latest one, I'm sure, before long. I, I left and went down to Mexico right just before it was announced. And so I, I didn't pick one up on, on this trip, but when I get back on the States, 
I'll probably grab one. I also have the GFX, which is a medium format uh, camera, and I've been working with that for uh, about a year now. Uh, it, it, interestingly, for my bird photography, I switched about a year and a half or two years ago for bird photography, I'm working with Olympus these days. Uh, I use a lot of filters, as I mentioned, and I use the Nisi filter system, and I'll talk more about filters and types of filters a little later on. So my approach to the medium, which I think is important to sort of establish some um, ground rules, if you will, as far as how I approach photography and how I I approach making images. And I have a an artist statement that I wanna um, read. So uh, if you will indulge me, I will read this uh, pretty short statement. Um, I believe in creating a photograph. That's a single trip of the shutter, a single opening and closing of the shutter. Anything else is not a photograph. It's so uh, HDR, or a, a photographic composites, if you're blending a number of different images, that's not a photograph, those are multiple photographs. So you can call it a photographic composite, you can call it a photographic illustration, uh, it doesn't matter to me, it, but what you can't call it is a photograph because it's not a photograph, it's multiple photographs. So um, I decided a number of years ago that I was not interested in being a photographic illustrator that I wanted to be a photographer. And that meant a single opening and closing of the shutter. So that's sort of philosophically how I limit myself in my work. I'm not saying that there's anything bad about photographic composites or HDR or any of the other types of techniques. There's some wonderful work that's being produced. It's not something that I'm interested in. So the work, all the work that you're gonna see is a single shot. It's a single opening and closing of the shutter. The exceptions to that are the um, panorama photos. I do a number of panoramas where I take several shots and then merge them into, into one panoramic view. And I will note that when I show them uh, and usually tell you the number of frames that I've uh, done in order to get that view. So. Um, the images that you're gonna see were created with using digital mirrorless cameras. While I enjoy the immediacy of this format, I reject the notion of streamlining my workflow. Each image has been individually and carefully created from concept to final print. I enjoy the high degree of precision and accuracy that modern digital cameras allow for in image making. When I compose a photograph, I utilize that precision. The camera angle and view is carefully considered. All of the visual elements within the scene are considered and arranged for a predetermined visual effect. At times, I use neutral density filters which allow for long exposures, or I select slow ISO speeds and small aperture settings, which also increases the exposure time, even on bright days. Typical exposures can run from one to several minutes long. During the image making process, I ponder over what filters, if any, to use for the creation of the image. And finally, I carefully select my exposure settings for optimal visual effect. This process requires a significant amount of time and thought, but it is my mantra in the meditation of image making. It soothes my mind and soul and allows me to see the world in front of my lens. I enjoy the process of absolute control up until the moment the image is recorded. Then I open the shutter and let go of the process. I never know what the final image will look like, and I have to trust that forces greater than me will give me the gift of a beautiful image. Once captured, I continue the same philosophy into the final image making stage. That is, I reject the use of presets or plug-in filters or other pre-canned special software effects. In my mind, the creation of art and the efficiency of labor have absolutely nothing in common. I believe there is no place for efficiency in the making of art. These images were individually post-processed in Adobe Camera Raw to adjust for color balance, contrast, sharpness and saturation, and clarity. Each image was then imported into Photoshop for minimal retouching. 
mostly just some burning or dodging, which is lightening or darkening of select areas within the image. This process ensures that each scene is depicted as a carefully considered capture of a unique moment in time, not a haphazard or lucky coincidence between a generic software program and a randomly set of selected set of pixels. Finally, I cut, finish, and assemble the frame and prepare the presentation of the prints. This laborious process keeps me in front of the image for a good long time. This gives me time to reflect on why I created the image. Is it a really good image? What does the image say? How does it say it? Is it effective? And on and on. I like to believe that this makes me a better photographer. However, I guess you will be the judge of that. So that's my artistic statement. And we will go on to uh, a little bit more about the work. Let's see. So camera technique, as far as camera technique goes, um, when I'm working uh, with landscape work, uh, about 90% of the time I am working on a tripod so that the camera is on a stable, a good, sturdy, stable tripod that allows me to use a variety of different uh, exposure times from very short to quite long. Uh, my Recent work in Mexico is a little bit of an exception in that, in that travel tends to be a little bit more fluid and uh, the demands of a tripod are sometimes just simply too complex to meet. But most of the time when I go out to shoot uh, landscape, I am working uh, with a camera mounted on the tripod. Um, I will talk more about sort of technique related stuff as it relates to individual photographs selection of times and, and exposure and things like that. Um, but one of the significant things in my camera technique is also my use of filters. I use a lot of filters while photographing landscape work for a variety of purposes. And the, the filters that I use are the drop-in filters. I, the, uh, this slide is sort of illustrating a number of different filter types. You have the, the circular filters, which are the thread-on filters that you put on the front of the lens. And I don't use those with the exception of a polarizer. When I wanna polarize the image, I will use a special polarizer that fits into the holder that you see here that, that is in the foreground of this image where you have the, the holder, the, the ring that goes onto the, the lens and then the, the square thing that fits over that ring that holds the square or rectangular filters that you see there. Uh, the thread on filters are very uh, cumbersome to use. They take a lot of time to thread them on, thread them off if you're taking uh, uh, and changing filters, which usually when you're working in landscape and working with filters, the light is changing rapidly, you need to work rapidly. And so the drop-in filters are a lot quicker to work. Uh, they, they drop in and out real fast and you can change them very, very quickly. And again, I'll talk more about how I apply these filters as I show you uh, images. So this is the camera set up with a filter holder just to show you what it looks like with a rectangular filter, which is one of the, um, the uh, primary filters that I use is the rectangular. I use both the square and rectangular filters. The square tend to be neutral density, straight neutral density, so that I'm able to get to slower shutter speeds. The rectangular ones are, uh, are graduated filters that allow you to darken, uh, typically uh, you're gonna darken the sky most often. So one of the primary things you get into right away is composition. And I wanna just uh, talk a few minutes about composition as a concept in image making, because there's a lot of people talk, oh, you've got to have good composition for the photograph. And what does that mean? Well, certainly uh, there's a number of different uh, ways of looking at composition and 
thinking about it and there are what people refer to as the rules of composition so uh personally i like edward weston and what he has to say about composition edward weston has several quotes uh, i'm going to show you a few of them he's he was a very colorful photographer uh and uh, i liked his sensibility and basically what he said was good composition is merely the strongest way of seeing so it, that kind of spells it out right there. He goes on to say that um, when the subject matter is forced to fit into preconceived patterns, there can be no freshness of vision. Following rules of composition can only lead to tedious repetition of pictorial cliches. I couldn't agree with him more. Um, yes, it's nice to know sort of what the rules are, but you know, run with the scissors, break the rules. And uh, many times that will give you the best uh, photograph that you can make. What are the rules of composition? Well, one of them is the rule of thirds. Rule of thirds states that rather than divide your frame up in the middle, like this uh, illustration shows, which makes for a very static looking photograph, you should think of it in terms of thirds so that you place prominent elements excuse me, along these lines of thirds, the horizon line, either a third of the way up. So the sky occupies two thirds of the frame or vice versa, only a third of the frame. And you put important elements at the intersection of where these lines intersect. So basically that's the rule of thirds. You can take it a step further. There was a number of artists, uh, Renaissance artists who came up with what was called the divine ratio or the golden mean. Uh, it's a, actually can be expressed in a, in a mathematical equation. Uh, and it sort of carries this concept a little bit further. However, with photography, there's so many different elements that go into composition that it's not exactly the same as a painter. Painter's composition is different than the ideas and the thought that goes into a well-composed photograph, which is unique to photography because of the way that photography works. So to finish my discussion about composition, I am going back to Edward Weston again, who said to consult the rule of composition before making a picture is a little like consulting the law of gravitation before going for a walk. So uh, but composition is a very important part of it. I promised you that I would show you a bird in my photograph. So this is one of the birds that I have in my photograph. Um, and so composing and arranging those elements into a pleasing uh, view is very important. Um, this particular image, for instance, uh it happened very very fast uh i was um I, I was actually with a group we're driving down the road they had we we had spent several days this was on a circle tour around lake superior and the the participants were like oh you think we're going to get any fog john you think we're going to get any fog i want to photograph a nice foggy morning so we were at a particular location we were there for um two, uh, three mornings. The third morning we woke up and we had to, we, we got an early start that day because we had to make a big drive to get to the next location. And so we had a long distance to travel. Well, wouldn't you know, we wake up and it, we're up before the sunrise and it's foggy, it's beautiful foggy morning. Students are like dying. They're just like, oh, I want to get out and photograph. I'm like, okay, we'll, we'll stop along the way as we drive because we're going through some very beautiful areas. And I said, you know, we'll pull over as soon as we get an opportunity and we'll photograph in the fog. Okay. So we took off and started driving. Well, wouldn't you know it? We drive for, it, we're driving for about half hour, 45 minutes before sunrise. And it's totally dark, but we're driving through the fog. As soon as the sun starts coming out, as soon as it starts lightening up, the fog goes away, right? <laughs> we go around a bend, drop down into this little valley. There's this little lake beautiful fog just as the sun's coming up great place to pull over pull over everybody gets out of their car grabs their gear goes rushing over to the lake i'm standing right next to a guy i go down to the lake shore i'm set up to photograph this 
as a typical landscape photographer would. I'm using a fairly small aperture. I'm using a low ISO so that I can capture the best possible color and I can get good definition. And I, I turn and look and down the shore is this merganser is working his way down the shore and he's right close to the shore and, and he sees us at the last second. He sort of pops out in the lake a few feet, which places him perfectly in the frame for me. Problem is, is I'm at, you know, I'm at about two second exposure, two or three second exposure at F13 or F14 and an ISO of 100. And I'm looking, I'm going, oh my God. So very rapidly, I had to change my ISO, increase my ISO up to about 400 or, or maybe even 800 for the photograph, open up the aperture as much as I dare to so I can still hold the definition and depth of field and get a shot of the duck so that the duck is sharp and not blurred. But I pulled off the photograph. I waited just a, a beat because I had that set when the duck was just coming into the frame and I waited for the duck to get to that particular spot in the frame so that it created a nice balance. Still had some room in front of them and um, still had, it was, in, it was sort of leading into the frame and had a, a nice visual balance and took the photograph, took one shot. I got one shot off. And then that was basically it. The duck was gone and just moved. They can swim quite quickly, especially when they're trying to get around somebody. And they, they, they were gone. They were done. I got back and, and showed this photograph to the guy that was standing right next to me. And he goes, where was that duck? I never even saw it. So being aware of your surroundings and being aware of what's going on, I think, is a critical part of seeing photographically and being able to see the options and the opportunities that come your way. So here I'm using a neutral density filter so that I can use a long exposure. I've got a four stop neutral density uh, um, filter on the lens. That's a, that's a solid neutral density filter, one of the square ones that goes over the lens. I have a graduated neutral density, a three stop graduated neutral density to darken the upper part of the image where the sun is um, so that it doesn't get blown out. My exposure is eight seconds and my aperture, I'm stopped down to about F16 here with this aperture so that I get this long exposure and I'm using a pretty low ISO, I think around 100. I timed the photograph, I set up, this was uh, the headwaters of the Mississippi in Northern Minnesota. I wanted to shoot across this little they, the, the little series of rocks where you can walk across the um, the the headwaters there, uh, and I I timed the photograph so that the sun that was breaking the horizon was illuminating the the trees fully illuminating the trees that were across the the, the river from me, leaving the foreground in in the shade which I also knew would create a bluer look. To the light so you get this deep rich blue in the foreground that leads you pull in the brighter area pulls you into the shot i'm going to pause for a second and, and just check nancy if there's any questions so far about a number of the things that i've um, talked about actually i don't see anything in the chat yet you must right. be answering all of the questions as you go <laughs> for now sure thank you so this was another photograph from northern Minnesota. This was, I did this for the Nature Conservancy for the um, Wallace Dayton Preserve in northwestern Minnesota. Um, the Dayton family is a big family in, in Minnesota in politics as well as business. They owned a very large um, department store chain uh, that uh, eventually got absorbed by Macy's, but they were uh, a longtime standard of Minnesota shopping with their Dayton store. But at any rate, they were also phil philanthropic and they donated the money to the Nature Conservancy so that they could preserve 10,000 acres in Northwest Minnesota. The Nature Conservancy hired me to go out and photograph that um, property. I saw this scene in the middle of the day. I was, uh, the site manager took me around to a number of different places. And, and when I laid eyes on this, I said, this 
is where I want to be at sunset because I saw the photographic potential right away with that group of aspen trees, the color, the, the, the changing uh, leaves, the, the beautiful rich red grasses and the vast open expanse uh, around it and said, okay, this is where I've got to be. So I went there and I set up and I took the photograph and I, I photographed it from a number of different angles. And then these clouds moved in, just these wispy little cirrus clouds that moved in. And I, I walked back around to this view, saw it with the clouds and said, I got to set up and shoot again from, from this side. So again, I'm using a graduated neutral density filter to kind of darken down the pop part of the photograph. Uh, and that sort of caps that photograph uh, and, and brings you back into it. I'm using a wide angle lens. When you photograph with wide angle lenses, different lenses do different things for perspective on landscape. And long lenses, as you know, because you're birding photographers, so you know this, Long lenses tend to compact space. It makes elements that are in the photograph appear closer together than what they actually are, compacts them. Wide angle lenses do the opposite. They tend to uh, explode or refer outward in the photograph. They exaggerate the distance between uh, objects in the scene. For landscape photography, wide angle lenses I use a lot because I like that sort of that explosive aspect of it. But I do things visually to kind of bring the viewer back in. I want this tension between this very expansive and explosive sort of visual feel with sort of capping it to bring the viewer back in. And the graduated neutral density filters help me achieve that. They darken down, in particular, they darken down the top which tends to be one of the areas, as you'll see in many later images, where you have um, clouds or a whiter sky, which tends to, uh, will lead the viewer off the image, especially with a wide angle lens. If it's, it has an explosive field and you have bright areas that are at the top or on the edges of the image, the viewer's eye will just sort of wander off the image. And that's not what you want. So by using the graduated neutral density filters, I can pull the viewer back into the image by darkening those areas down and pull them into the image more. And I'll show you some examples on that a little later as we go through this. Um, people ask me, they say, well, why don't you just do this in post-process? You can do it in post-process. You can do it, just about everything you can with filters as a post-process. You can use a graduated uh, neutral density filter in post-process that you apply, or you can simply darken areas down, or you can use HDR and a number of different effects. The, rep the reply that I have to that is, yes, you can. There's many things that you can do in post-process that you, the filters um, are doing in camera. Uh, there's a couple things that you can't do. You can't you, you, unless you have built-in filters in your camera, like many of the Olympus cameras do, you can't get to the slower shutter speeds without applying a straight neutral density. So you can't get into the really long exposures. And even the Olympus cameras are limited. They go, I think, five stops, and that's about it. And many times I'm putting much more on uh, as far as neutral density goes. But uh, the most important thing is, for me, is I, I like... I like fiddling around with a camera in the field. That's one of the most important things. I enjoy that process of working with the camera in the field. As I mentioned in my artist statement, that's part of it. It slows me down. It sort of allows me to see the scene in front of the camera. And that's uh, an important part for it for me. This is a classic example of sort of a wide angle look uh, and a wide angle feel in an image, explosive. But where I've selected, in this case, not so much with the filters, but with the framing, darker areas that cap that and bring the viewer into the image more. It brings them, it adds depth, and it draws them back into the image more. I think we have a, a question in the chat. I'll take that if we... Yep. The question in the chat. 
is I'm not on your graduated filters. Are they different f-stop filters or do you stack filters? Um, and the answer to that is yes. <laughs> um, they they come with different um, uh, neutral density levels, so you can get graduated neutral densities everywhere from one stop up to five stops. I don't know of anybody that's making a stronger graduated neutral density filter than five stops, but you can go from one all the way up to five. One is really not very effective. Uh, so neither is two. I carry a three, a four, and a five. And yes, I will even stack those. There are times when I will have um, up to 10 stops or more of neutral density on the sky to darken the sky down. This particular shot right here actually has nine stops. It has a five and a four to really darken that sky down. When uh, the, the presentation before it started, there was somebody that was talking about um, going to a cypress swamp that is frequented by Clyde Butcher. Clyde Butcher is a great um, utilizer of this technique. Traditionally, he did it in a different way because he was able to. He worked with view cameras. Um, I have tremendous respect for Clyde Butcher and his work. And I got a chance to meet him. I actually traveled down to Florida. I was done with a workshop in Maine and I was living in Minnesota, but I made a detour down to <laughs> Florida, to Southern Florida, just so that I could meet Clyde. It was about a year or two after he had his stroke. And I thought, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I admired him and his work and I never got a chance to meet Ansel Adams. So I said, by God, I'm going to get a chance to meet Clyde Butcher. So I drove down to Florida and, and met him. And while I was waiting, it was, he was doing one of his um, gallery uh, visits and he hadn't shown yet. And his daughter runs the gallery and, and um, I also, I like to wear cowboy hats. I have a big cowboy hat, right? <laughs> so um, I, I'm hanging out and people are like coming in and they're sort of doing double takes because they're thinking I'm Clyde, you know? And his daughter walked up and said, we're going to give you the Clyde Butcher lookalike contest win. <laughs> and when he walked in, he while I'm standing in the gallery, he walks in, he looks over at me and he goes, <laughs> <laughs> So I, it was nice to meet him. It was nice to connect with him. Clyde worked with view cameras. What view cameras have is they have a lens board on the front of the camera. And that lens board can move around. Okay, you can swing, tilt, shift uh, that lens board. And uh, Ansel Adams did this. Edward Weston did this. Uh, you know, Clyde does it. All, you name a sort of classic uh, view camera, landscape photographer, they use this technique time and time again. They would put a wide angle lens on their view camera. What that meant was that that wide angle lens has limited coverage as far as the circle of coverage that it will give. A camera has an artificial uh, uh, rectangle portion of that that it records on either film or the sensor but the uh the the lens projects a circular coverage and mm -hmm. it will fall off at the edges of that circle so you don't have as much light intensity and with a view camera the wonderful thing about a view camera is that you can keep straight lines straight and the way that you keep straight lines straight is by keeping the camera perfectly level to uh, the, the world. It's, it's perfectly level to the surface of the world. As, and then straight lines will be straight. Trees will be straight, buildings will be straight, everything's straight. What happens though is a lot of times you cut off the top of the building or the top of the trees that you want to get in the image. So you tilt the camera up. When you tilt the camera up, those straight lines, it's called parallax, end up with an effect called parallax, and they start to converge. So they look like they're falling over backwards. So 
the view camera allows you to keep the camera axis perfectly level, but shift the lens up so that you get the top of the uh, trees or the top of the building. What happens though, because you're getting into the edge of the coverage of the lens, is it darkens that area down. So if you look at Clyde's work, you look at his landscapes, one of the signatures of them is he has these beautiful, deep, dark, black skies. Everything is darkened up there. And what that does visually is it forces your eye into the middle of the photograph more. It draws you into that photograph. Very similar to this. You take a modern digital camera that you can't shift the lens around on, and the only way to sort of replicate that feel is by using the graduated neutral densities on the lens. Or you can do it, certainly do it in post-process. But what the graduated neutral densities do for me is they sort of start me down that road. I do a little of both. I do burning and dodging in my images in post-process. So I lighten and darken certain areas in the image. And the, the graduated neutral density start me that way. And then I finish it off in um, post-process. Looks like we've got another question or two. I'll take that. I don't see any. Oh, I see a two up there on the chat. Yeah, I think we're good for now. Okay, all right. Beautiful. So these photographs are from a variety of different places. Um, Northern Minnesota, I travel extensively throughout um, North Central United States, North Dakota, Minnesota, around Lake Superior. Um, in Newfoundland, I, I go to Newfoundland frequently and photograph there. And then now I have been moving south uh, during the um, colder months in Minnesota. I start, I'm a snowbird, a, a unapologetic snowbird I had south. I'm based out of Utah, a little town called Bluff, Utah, in the Four Corners area down by um, Monument Valley, uh, south of Moab a couple hours. I, um, I'm not a big crowded people place person. I tend to stay away from the heavier uh, used areas. So the town of Bluff suits me really well. It's got 300 people in it. It's <laughs> out in the middle of the desert. I love it. Um, if you want to drive, if you want to get a six pack of beer, you got to drive an hour and a half to go get a six pack of beer. I'm not a beer drinker, big beer drinker. So, uh, much any, so, so it doesn't bother me that much anymore, but, uh, it, it's out there and, uh, I like it. And I, I run a lot of workshops down there too. Um, this is from Newfoundland. This shot, uh, I mean, one of the things that I think um, landscape photographs to have good impact have to excite you visually. They have to look at the world in a little bit different way than what you would simply see as a regular sort of regular depiction of the world. So in this one, I saw this building and, and this thing is, I mean, it's like, why? <laughs> why, <laughs> why is there a house built on the side of the rock, uh, you know, here? Um, and I can't answer that question exactly why. Uh, I mean, it must have been quite a challenge to get the materials there to build this place. I can't imagine uh, living there if it was for living purposes. And it does look like it was for living purposes. In Newfoundland, there's the architecture, uh, the maritime architecture there is very specific. There are things that are called stages and warehouses and um, boat houses, certainly that all serve specific purposes for the fishing industry that was there for hundreds of years, the, the salt cod. But this structure is built like a house, not like one of the other fishing structures that you would normally see. So um, I can't imagine living there when the ocean was riled up and you had a lot of waves crashing. But um, so I wanted to, to sort of create this surrealistic effect. So I used a very long exposure, uh, a couple minutes long. Um, I did that by using a very heavy, because it's bright and sunny, uh, I used a 10-stop neutral density filter. 
I also used a couple of uh, graduated neutral densities to darken the sky down quite a bit. And wow. you got a couple minute exposure. So the clouds are blurred because they're moving. And then the water is totally smooth, but you have these little areas sort of around the rocks where you can tell if there's uh, water movement and motion. And that creates the effect that you're seeing in this photograph. Another shot of uh, Bond Falls, which is in uh, upper Michigan, UP of Michigan, very similar to the winter one that you saw. Mm -hmm. I, I call this the Dr. Seuss tree. It reminds me of the <laughs> Dr. Seuss illustration. Uh, and this is uh, in northern Minnesota uh, along Lake Superior. Uh, and again, this was uh, created by using a very long exposure, a couple minutes long, um, a pretty heavy uh, neutral density filter on. It was a little more overcast day. I believe I was using an eight stop neutral density and then stacked a couple of uh, four and five stop graduated neutral density to really darken those clouds down to, <laughs> to give them more of an ominous feel and also cap that top so that it brings the viewer into the image more. So photographing um, Lake Superior is going to be very similar to photographing the ocean because Lake Superior is huge. It's uh, 80 miles wide, 160 miles long. Um, and, and you can have waves that are, well, that we just went by the gales of November. It has waves big enough to, to sink a 750 foot ship. So it, it can have very large waves. Um, and so the, what I have learned photographing Lake Superior, you can apply this to the Atlantic Ocean and the times are going to be similar. You might have to run your own test to sort of see, but I kind of divide my exposures up into three areas. I think about three different things that I want to do if I, for the effect that the visual effect that I want to create. So if you want to create a visual effect where you have this movement and motion of the waves, that is a result of an exposure that's going to be somewhere between about a second and a half and four seconds long. Somewhere in that area is going to create these swirls and movements of the water to give you the pattern in the water. If you want to smooth, you see that the water has sort of a texture to it, where you see the, the, the white caps that have moved around has a little bit of a texture. If you want to create that perfectly smooth, like glass effect with water, if it's not too rough, it's really rough, it will get foggy, it won't get dark and smooth, it will get light and foggy looking. But if you want the perfectly smooth water, you need to get it to at least about 30 seconds for your exposure. If you want to blur the clouds where the, you're getting movement with the clouds and the clouds are blurred, you need to get into a couple minutes. You need to get into about two minutes. And that's going to vary, of course. All these things are going to vary a little bit with whatever's going on atmospherically um, with things. But... Uh, you know, if the clouds are really moving fast, of course, you can go with probably a little less than two minutes. You might get it by with a minute. Probably not really that effective less than a minute. You need to get up into the multiple minutes typically to smear the clouds so that get that nice movement look to them and smooth look to them. Uh, so I think in terms of, do I want to take an exposure that is between one and a half and four seconds long, do I want to take an exposure that's 30 seconds long, or do I want to get into multiple minutes? And the resulting visual effects are, do I want a swirling pattern? Do I want something that's perfectly smooth? Do I want the clouds, the movement of the clouds? And that's sort of the way I divide this up and think about it. Um, this is a place in uh, Oregon called um, Thor's Well. And it's basically a hole 
in the, the there's sort of a shelf and uh, that sits up from the water. The waves come crashing over and then the water goes rushing down into this hole for Thor as well. And uh, in this case, black and white uh, replicated this very well. There's another image I have later on that's color. I'll talk about those differences in, in, a, in a minute when I get to the color one. But here I wanted to create that sense of the water movement and the motion. So I'm at around four seconds. I've got a three up there in the chat. Do we have another question? Um, if not from anybody else, I okay. have a couple questions. All right. Um, what brand of, of uh, filters do you use? I use Nisi brand filters, N-I-S-I, -I, Nisi. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of different filters out there. One of the primary reasons I use the Nisi filters is because of the holder. The holder uh -huh. mechanism, which you can see here on the camera, when I, if I want to put a polarizer on, this is mm -hmm. genius. Whoever came up with this is a genius. You know, genius has come up with very simple solutions to mm -hmm. problems. And, uh, you know, typically, especially with these filter systems, if you want to put a polarizer on, you got to thread that polarizer on, so you can thread it on. And it's it's kind of a pain because it's hard to get it in there quite right. And it's hard to get it off when you want to go take it off. And what the Nisi system did is they made the mount a bayonet mount. You just go boom, and it's on. Real quick, real fast. You want to take it off, you just grab it and you just take it off with a bayonet mount. So you is can there, take the polarizer on and off very, very quickly. Is and there a name name for that holder? It's the Nisi V7. V7, huh? V7, as in version now, seven. Is that the one that you use and you can fit like all the multiple? Um, yep. So with this holder, you can bayonet mount the filter in and uh, it fits right in here. You control the polarizer by a little wheel on the back of the holder so you can turn the polarizer, even if you stack a bunch of filters in front of it. You don't have to reach around and try to grab it. You just control it by a little wheel on the back side of the holder. It's got three slots, so I can put three filters in uh -huh. here. And you don't get any corner, corner vignetting, even with a wide angle. I use a, up to a 15 millimeter, uh, equivalent of a 15 millimeter wide angle and I get no corner uh, corner vignettes from the obstruction of it at all. It's very clean. Um, and so you can actually stack up to four filters because you polarizer plus uh, three more. Wow. And I have another question on your, um, I think they're, yeah, the graduated filters. When you have an uneven landscape, which generally speaking, we have uneven landscapes, uh, how do you not get a line? Um, yep. So there's there's basically there's three different types of graduated filters that you can use. Actually, four. four. There's um, what's called a, a hard graduated filter, which gives you a very distinctive line between, <laughs> excuse me, the 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 neutral density part and the clear part. It's a very uh -huh. distinct line. Um, you would only want to use those where you have like maybe a lake or an ocean. I use them on Lake Superior because we have this definite horizon. You can drop it right down, but you have to be very careful to get it right on the horizon so that you don't get the mm. uh, unevenness. So you've got to be careful with the hard ones. There's called a soft graduated, which does a very gradual change between clear and the dark. And Nisi has some mediums that does sort of does it at, between it's between the hard and the soft. And I carry mm -hmm. the medium around too, because that's a very handy one to have. There's the fourth kind, which is called a reverse graduated neutral density. And it puts the darkest part. So it puts a lot of the most common one is a three stop in the middle, two stop at the top and clear on the bottom. I don't <laughs> use the reverse ones much at all. Um, I, I, I just don't photograph that way. But uh, the idea being that you would use that heaviest part for a sunrise or sunset where the sun's on the horizon mm. and you're trying to darken that part down. So to get to your question of what do you do when you have uneven, which a lot of the images 
that you've seen are that way. And the, the in post-process, your, your shadow slider can open up those areas a, a tremendous amount so that it, it gets rid of them. And then also with some judicious uh, burning and dodging, you hmm. can um, kind of alter uh, that so that you don't see a, a distinct line at all. Um, it's not typically not an, an, an issue. Great, thank you. Sure. All right, I'm gonna go up here because I think what people are doing is they're putting questions in the chat, but they may not be addressing them to you. Well, <laughs> oh no, I'm getting them. Oh, okay. Uh, well, right. one of them was a smile from Paula because she really appreciates what you're saying. <laughs> okay. And another one says, thank you so much for your presentation. Your work is incredible. Well, so, thanks. Um, they're not exactly questions yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. so I'll keep track. Uh, all right, thanks. I wasn't sure. So I yep. just thought. Um, so here, this is, uh, uh, again, Lake Superior, I think. Yeah, this is the one actually I wanted to go to. I call this one the uh, six-minute uh, sunrise. I'm sorry, wow. six-minute sunset. It's a six-minute exposure. You get that really smooth effect from the lake as well as the clouds. And the, the, the clouds are just smeared across the frame. Uh, and the color is also sort of blended and smeared across mm. the frame as well. So North Dakota, I've, I've got a few shots from North Dakota in here. Um, This is a this is a good example of one where obviously to darken those clouds down on the top part, you're going to get the graduated neutral density into areas in the lower part, which is where the this is split rock lighthouse. So you get them into the foghorn building and the lighthouse itself. The light from the lighthouse sort of counteracts some of that. But then also by opening up your shadows and then also going in and just doing a little bit of dodging sort of eliminates that transition uh, zone uh, uh, mm -hmm. between the, with that's caused by the graduated neutral density. What software do you use? I work with uh, Adobe products and um, uh, Camera Raw. I use Adobe Camera Raw. I don't use Lightroom a whole lot. I mean, I'm proficient in in uh, the develop aspects of Lightroom because so many students use Lightroom that um, I, I have to know Lightroom. I'm not a catalog guy though. Uh, so I'm kind of old fashioned. I use Bridge as a browser. Uh, I use Adobe Camera Raw, which is the raw converter that's associated with Bridge. And then I go into Photoshop for my final retouching. Mm. Somehow I've got <clears throat> something set there. Now you can see the full frame. I clicked on it and zoomed it a little bit, I guess. I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, it, you know, one of the, one, I guess, one of the tricks when you're photographing rocky shorelines, uh, like, like both of these, is you know, if you can break up the rock area, um, so you have it, it typically, I don't like to put a whole lot of dark rock in the foreground. I want to break it up somehow here on this one. I've got sort of the water coming around in front of that rock a little bit. It's nice if you can go dark light, dark light in the image. So you have areas of the dark rock, but it's not all solid dark rock. That, that rock, especially on the north shore of Lake Superior, which is a basalt rock, a volcanic rock, and it gets really dark. You splash a little water on it, and it's just black as ink. Um, and so it, it, it just, you know, sucks up all the light. So you have to look for things to sort of break it up visually the way you compose the photograph. Hmm. Wow. 
So we're jumping around, we're down to Utah. Um, and then back up to Lake Superior. So with, um, with photographs, uh, with landscape photographs, they need, like I said, they need to compel the viewer. They need to reveal something about the world that excites people visually. They're more than just line and shape and light. So thinking about ways that you can expand that, you can expand that notion about uh, the, the world that we live in, that we can illustrate something that excites people visually. That's what I strive to do with my landscape photographs. This is my daughter and a friend of hers. They wanted to be photographed with the Milky Way. I said, sure. I'd love to do that. So my daughter's the one on the right. She's she's a hairdresser. She specializes in nothing but dreadlocks. <laughs> Kid makes tons of money. I mean, it's, I, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she has clients who fly in from out of state just to have them have her do them their hair. She's very well known in a very niche market. And uh, she makes lots and lots of money. So anyhow, with this one, uh, so they, I, they had a little lamp. I, we had to put a little, actually, I wrapped a little blue towel around it because it was too bright. I mm -hmm. wanted to create that little splash of pool of light. I, need, I, I knew I needed to illuminate them, but I didn't want to illuminate any of the rock around them except for that little pool of light kind of given by that little lamp that they were holding. So the solution that I had was I, I had a handheld spotlight. It was a very directional light. I set up the shot, I opened the shutter, and I hit them with that spotlight, and it totally just blasted them out. They were white. Oh, so <clears throat> then I went, okay, I'll do it shorter. So I did it as quick as I could, still just blasted them out, because it was a very strong uh, spotlight. So what I ended up having to do is open the shutter. It was a 40 second exposure. And I turned around and I didn't run, but I hustled as fast as I could over this uneven rock, pitch black, as quickly as I could, counting out in my head the number of seconds. And at the last moment, at the last couple seconds, turned around and just hit the light as quickly as I could to kind of give them a glancing blow. And after about a dozen attempts, I got one that worked. So that's how I created this particular shot. I do have a question. Yep. Um, it's with the lighthouse shot. They are asking, did you select the lighthouse and mask it to cope with the dodging? No, um, I hate masks. I hate masking. Uh, I use a technique called the history brush. Uh, and the history brush is a much uh, more fluid way of applying burning and dodging. And um, masking creates an edge. Wherever you have an edge, you have potential problems. As a printmaker, as an extensive printmaker using inkjet printers, uh, masks create issues and problems, and I do not like them. So I don't mask any of my images anymore. I used to. I used to mask extensively. And then I discovered the history brush. And I sort of migrated away from masking. So I do no masking. I do all my changes with a history brush, which is it gives you infinite feathering capabilities. If you need it to only have maybe a two pixel feather here, you can do it while having a 30 pixel feather over there. And you mm -hmm. can do that on the fly and you can do it very, very quickly. So I find that masking works much, much better than, um, I mean, the history of brush works much, much better than masking. So I use that technique for lightening and darkening. So the, they said, is that what you used on the lighthouse then? Yep. Yeah. History brush to dodge areas with with uh, by lightning with with that, and there is if you go to my website coltsnapphotography.com and you go into the blog area, 
there are a number of tutorials in there it's i apologize it's not real well organized but if you go into those tutorials you will see a tutorial on using the history brush and you can it's a step-by-step -step illustrated tutorial on how to use the history brush so this image uh, uh an island on lake superior um and the title of this is i you know i am an island uh Again, very heavy, uh, probably about nine stops, the four and the five stop graduated filter for the top to darken those clouds down. Uh, and then uh, overall neutral density, a four stop neutral density, because I wanted to get it down to a couple seconds. I didn't want it real long to create that texture. I'm at about, I think this exposure is around three seconds, two to three seconds. And what I noticed was uh, with this island, you sort of had the waves coming in on both sides of the island and they would hit roughly in the middle and create this sort of tumultuous area. When the waves came in, they would cross over. And that's what caught my eye. And that's sort of what I wanted to capture was that that roundness around the island of, of the, the texture of that water as those waves sort of crashed into each other. this was a very very chilly day this is called freezing spray i read the weather report for the day the next day uh the day after and this is by the way the last winter i spent in minnesota and um, the weather report said freezing spray i went freezing spray what's freezing spray so the next morning I went out and I realized what freezing spray was. So as the water hit the, the rocky shoreline and came up, it instantly turned into ice um, and it coated everything. So when I went out to photograph and set up the camera, uh, as long as I kept the lens pointed away from the wind direction, I was fine. I could photograph. But within a couple minutes, literally maybe two minutes of shooting, the entire back of the camera was coated with ice. I couldn't have changed the settings if I wanted to. They were it was it was encased in ice. The tripod was encased in ice. I couldn't have changed the height or the setting at all. Um, I was wearing wool pants and and a jacket. Um, and a lot of times I would also wear like a snowmobile outfit that gives you a very hard uh, uh, canvas that sort of protects you from the wind. But in this case, I didn't, it was only 20 below. It wasn't 30 below. So I didn't think I needed the snowmobile suits, mm. but I went out there and the wool slacks are great for keeping you warm, but they're kind of porous. And this mm. freezing spray turned into like thousands of little icicles that would just pierce Ouch. so i'm standing there with my back to the wind and the back of my legs are getting just like nailed by these little icicles that are coming all the way through it was probably physically one of the most challenging photographs that i've i've done the temperatures at that the wind chill I don't know. The, the the straight temp was 20 below. I have no idea. Oh, my God. Was. The winds were, were gusting over 40 to 50 miles an hour. Here's the color shot of Thor's well. Very oh. different looking image. Very soft. The mm -hmm. black and white is very sharp, very crisp. Um, the color is, is a much softer image. Um, it lent itself better to color. Uh, I'm a true believer that each image will tell you what it needs to be, whether it's color or black and white. I A lot of times I have preconceived notions of what I want. I go out there and think, I'm gonna make this a black and white. In fact, I strive to do that, strive to sort of pre-visualize what the final image will be, but I'm surprised a lot. Um, I, I envisioned that previous one of the tree, the freezing spray, I had originally envisioned that as a black and white. But when I worked it up, it just it, in black and white, it didn't work. It worked in color, even though it's a very monochromatic image. It needed that, that little bit of blue to really hold that cold. Uh, and certainly here on this set scene, 
uh, I got good black and whites out of it. This one was was a uh, color shot because it has that nice soft atmospheric look to it, mm -hmm. uh, the soft pastel colors. So I'm going to talk a little bit about creating a sense of place because I think with landscape photography, creating a sense of a place is an important part of the photographic uh, process and thought process. And some very simple techniques and tips that you can use is how we use light. So here I have this little mountain scene. This is in North Central Mexico. Uh, and the, the, in this particular scene, I, I got here, I set up, I was photographing, and I noticed the light playing off the hills. And in this first shot, the light is illuminating that first hill. Look at what happens when I wait and the light changes and it no longer illuminates that front hill. Now the light pulls you into the photograph more. It creates more of a sense of the place because you're, you're being brought into it. With this one, your eye goes to that brighter area in the foreground and it kind of goes off the frame. It loses the viewer. Here, it pulls you into the view, into the scene uh, better. Similar situation with this one, although this one was done and created uh, in post-process where I photographed the scene. I've got this tree in the foreground. This is down in Utah, the desert, and then the Abajo Mountains with the storm passing over. And I simply darkened that foreground more. I brought the foreground down and I brought the clouds down on the top to sort of balance the two uh, as far as their, the, the density or the depth of the black. And look at what it does. It just sort of brings you into that photograph, brings you back into those mountains better. You're not distracted by those little weedy elements in the foreground. This is another scene from Mexico. We were on a rooftop uh, patio and I saw this scene. This is a place called Valle de Bravo, which is near the, um, the monarch butterflies, which is, are, is an incredible experience and an incredible a uh, uh, place to go and see where you can see literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of monarch butterflies so thick that they weight down the branches of the trees and the trees are sagging because they have so many butterflies on them. Uh, and this is a little town called Valle de Bravo and it's near that area. Uh, I saw this scene and you have, this is sort of a metaphorical typical scene in a lot of Mexican towns is brightly lit main street that goes up the hill to the illuminated cathedral or church on the hill that dominates the landscape of the town, uh, both metaphorically as well as visually. This particular scene, there were lights to the left and to the right of the street. Uh, they, they were lighter, but when I saw this, I saw the power of being able to use that main street to lead the viewer up to the church in the distance. So in post-process, I dramatically darkened the sides and brought them way down so that they were muted. You can see some detail in there. I don't know if you see it so well on the monitor, but you can see a little bit of detail on the sides, but it's not the predominant thing. Your eye goes up that street and leads up to the cathedral. Shiprock in New Mexico. <clears throat> I was I happened to be there on a wonderful day with the light playing off of the the um, the rock formation. I've been there a number of times. Most of the time, it looks like this: stark, clear, perfectly clear skies. Um, but again, darkening those skies down, making them black. Just give them. Give them that really good, solid punch. <laughs> Monument Valley. And then, of course, the famous mittens. Um, <sighs> and so I, I darkened the, that there was a storm moving across. Uh, I darkened the sky down considerably. It's a long exposure, several minutes to kind of blur those clouds 
But then notice that I kept the road in the foreground as a visual element to sort of bisect through there and create some visual interest in the foreground. Wow. Right eye of Monument Valley. The, in Utah, in the Four Corners area where I've been working for several years now, the night skies are incredible. They're just fantastic to be able to go out and photograph skies that are black as night. They are black. Uh, some of the darkest places on the face of the, on, on, in the United States are down in that area. And one of the things that I've been doing that I really enjoyed is seeking out uh, the petroglyphs and the ancient rock art uh, mm -hmm. where it lines up potentially with the night skies and hey. then illuminating, bless you, illuminating the rock art and then balancing it with the night skies, which is kind of tricky because it doesn't take much illumination at all. It's a very small amount of illumination to, um, to pop out these foreground elements. This is the hey. ghost, ghost man panel. Notice that the figure, see there's two, there's three figures there. Oh. One is a, one's a spirit because it's not, it's dotted, dotted between two solid figures. So there's a spirit that's connecting those two people. Wow. Do you get the Northern Lights in Utah? Not in Utah. Here? You get the Northern Lights in Minnesota. We get them quite frequently there. But Utah is a little far south. I was just wondering, because those pictures then look like they had the Northern Lights in them. There's a phenomenon that's called air glow, okay. and it gives it that, that green glow effect. And it has to do with um, sort of how much dust or, or, or uh, particles are in the atmosphere that's being re reflected by residual light that's huh. still there. It's something that the camera tends to pick up more than what your eye does, although there are nights in Utah when you go out and you can visually see it with your eyes and you're just like, wow, it's a okay. big air glow tonight. So How do you spell that? Air glow? Uh-huh. A-I-R and then G-L-O-W, air glow. Oh, okay. I know our time's running short, John, but you have some hints for us on some of these night shots are incredible. Thank you. Uh, this is a Rochester panel. Wow. Uh, for night skies, you're going to photograph with high ISOs. Uh, you're going to be working with um, it's probably 32 at least, if not 6,400. A starting point, which you'll have to figure out because every camera and lens setup is different. Uh, you're going to use a wide open aperture. Hopefully your aperture is at least 2.8, if, if not faster. Uh, and your ISO is going to be somewhere between 32 and 6400, depending on how your camera reacts to noise characteristics. Um, and then your exposure is going to be roughly 30 seconds in order to get foreground stuff. There's a lot of people that talk about doing night skies and they say, oh, you can't go more than 10 seconds or 15 seconds. They have a formula. Uh, a 500 rule or something that they call it. And I just, I say to the 500 rule, it, it doesn't take into account the age of the camera, the speed of the lens, um, and then also what you want to get in the photograph if you want to get fair, foreground elements. I like to say I don't photograph, I'm not an, uh, an astrological photographer. That's not what I am. I'm a landscape photographer who happens to photograph at night. And so it's important for me to get those foreground elements in the image and illuminated either through applying uh, artificial illumination like this in certain cases or um, by whatever light that's there uh, because it's too big of an area to add light. Uh, and in that case, I need to use exposure, a, a strong enough exposure to capture the detail that I want that's in the shadow areas. 
I want to just move quickly into some Mexico work. It'll just take me a minute or two to flip through these um, because that's the other sort of case study. I've shown you a number of images from the Southwest, from the Utah area, sort of as creating a sense of place. And now I'm going to run through a few in Mexico uh, that are the same sort of thing, creating a sense of place in the photographs. Uh, we start out with this one, which I title a uh, physical manifestation of a figment of our imagination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is uh, San Miguel de Allende, which is a popular town for gringos. I think about 30% of the population is gringo. Um, and this is the, the cathedral, beautiful cathedral in the town square. And I just, so this is sort of a street photograph as well as kind of a landscape. Um, but uh, it illustrates one of the things I wanted to say. I mean, it, it has a, a dreamlike quality, which is the way I feel about Mexico, especially that north central part with all those towns that were built in the 1500s. I mean, the Mexicans came in. It was the largest transformation of wealth when the, when Spain uh, invaded and, and when Cortez took over the Mexican culture, it was the largest transformation of wealth from one culture to another in human history. Incredible amounts of silver and gold. And the Spaniards in this unprecedented explosion of, of deconstruction and reconstruction into uh, Spanish colonial architecture uh, rebuilt the entire central part of Mexico. And you go into these towns and they're quite incredible. They sent less than 20% of that wealth back to Spain. The rest was reinvested in that area in Mexico. There's my other bird shot. That's, that's oh. sort, of, sort of a landscape, you know, those wonderful. Uh, Magpie jays. Ah, they are neat. Orizaba. Ah, beautiful. The third tallest mountain in North America. Second highest, I think, second highest volcano in North America. Hmm. So that is the, the work. Um, I would invite you to take a look at my website, coldsnapphotography.com. I lead workshops throughout Mexico, Canada, and uh, the Southwest and Minnesota. And many of those are uh, birding as well as landscape. I think birding and landscape go together like peas and carrots. <laughs> the problem is, is that you tend to be uh, with birds, you've got this camera with a really long lens and you're, you know, concentrating on birds. Landscape takes a little bit of a different approach, but typically birding brings you into some of the most beautiful areas on the face of the earth. And so it's a shame not to sort of spend time doing both. And in particular, the workshop in Chiapas blends both landscape as well as birding opportunities. And the, the workshop in Newfoundland that I do also blends both birding as well as uh, landscape opportunities. And, and the one in Arizona that I'm doing too, which is the saguaro sunrise and night skies. It's got a strong birding aspect to it because the birds in the desert down there are wonderful that time of the year. So I'll take any questions. Uh... I just one, but. Would you use a flash to expose the foreground in a night shot? Um, I don't use flash. I use uh, LED lights. And I used to use uh, a LED panel by Savage. And the biggest problem I had was getting it low enough because those panels, you could turn them all the way down to the lowest possible setting. And they still kicked out too, way too much light. Uh, and so I, what I would do is I'd start putting napkins uh, <laughs> over the front 
to cover the front and and sort of throttle it down so only a narrow strip uh, was used was uh, being used. And then I had a um, participant that took a night sky workshop uh, come and say, hey, have you ever heard of these things called loom cubes? Yeah. L-U-M-C-U-B-E. And mm -hmm. I went, no. And she had a set. And uh, by the end of the workshop, I had ordered my own set. And they're fantastic. Uh, and they are able to go real low. And you can do incredible things with them. So that's what I'm using these days to illuminate foregrounds is a light kit called loom cube. I know that um, Hunts has talked about them. I mm -hmm. think that's one of the things that they did yep. sell. That's where I, I bought my set was from them. Yeah. They, you can get a two light set uh, kit and that's what I bought. I'll probably buy another one and get two more. So I have a total of four. Uh, and that two light kit is about 250 bucks wow. and it comes with all sorts of attachments. So there's about 125 a piece, which actually is a little less than the Savage uh, light panels. Those are closer to 150 a piece and oh. they don't give you all the features that the Loom Cube does. <clears throat> okay, let's see what else we have. Thank you for such a fun, informative evening. Buenos notes. <laughs> thank you, great presentation, amazing shots and ideas. Thank you so much, terrific presentation. Uh, Paula also said, love those birds. And we know which ones those were. <laughs> <laughs> and this has been such an interesting and informative presentation. Thank you. So it was beautifully received. Wonderful. You. Love your landscapes. Thank you. And Rick Schofield yeah. also said, thanks, just like everyone else. Enjoyed it very much. Good. So thank you so much. Um, if anybody's hadn't noticed, actually in the chat, I put your um, site address, this coldsnap.com address. So if thank anybody you. wants that address, look in the uh, chat and Did it's there. For one more question and comment? Sure. sure. Um, so I really admire and impressed by your work and the fact that you don't, apparently you do a lot of post-processing, but you do some. I'd be very interested to know more about that. And I'm wondering if you do any kind of teaching, workshops, coaching, private coaching on uh, post on your post-processing. Uh, process. Sure. Yep. So I teach three types of workshops. I teach workshops that are, are basically tours, that they're all about going out and photographing and you're moving and photographing all the time. There's no classroom aspect to it. Then I teach a second type of workshop, which is a combined workshop and photographing. And those tend to be the night sky workshops and the black and white ones. So I'm offering those in both places in Utah, as well as in Minnesota. And what those combine, because in particular night skies, the post-processing is very different from sort of typical, um, more, you know, other scenic uh, uh, photographs. Uh, and, and we go out and we go out at night, but then, you know, we sure we come back, we sleep a little bit in the morning, but then in the afternoon we're up. And so I do a classroom session that's uh, all about post-processing. And you do learn, I mean, you learn more than just night sky post-processing in those workshops, but it's particular to the night skies. The black and white ones, there's a couple of black and white landscape ones, one in Utah, as well as one up in Minnesota that, that are a similar sort of format where you're out shooting and then you're post-processing. And in particular on both of those, the night skies, as well as the black and white, you're printing your work too. Uh, I have printers, I have printers, actually I have printers in Utah and I have printers in Minnesota and I just delivered a printer down to Mexico City that I used for a workshop there and donated it to that organization, which I'm going to be using again in the summer at another organization. So uh, I have printers all over the place, but uh, you're, you're printing your work out and that is an important part of learning how, just how to post-process and how to get 
uh, good quality images because the print is the most demanding out of all the venues. It's surprising to me how much we get away with when we produce images that are just for show on the computer screen versus if you're producing it to go out to print. It's a much more demanding sort of environment or venue, if you will, in the print form. So those workshops combine both. And then I do one workshop a year in Minnesota on post-processing, and that's called the Art of the, the Fine Art Print. And that's all about um, post-processing. There's no shooting component to it. It's all in classroom post-processing. So nothing virtual online? I don't do anything online, no, especially with the post-processing. Yeah. Um, it's all to print. Got to be I want to invite you to come on out. Come on out to Thank you. Utah. I've, or... I've been taking some trips, and uh, we'll look into that. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Great presentation. Really. Thank you. So if everybody has asked their questions, um, all I can say is thank you. We loved it. It was inspiring. I love your landscapes. Thanks. Uh, just a lot to think about. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. Have a good night. Thank you very much again. Oh, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Bye -bye. you. Take care. Bye bye. And just to let everybody know, if they want to be part of the AE Photography Group, you should send your name, email address, and phone number to a website that we have, or email address rather, um, in the chat that Mary just posted. So okay. it's AEPG <clears throat> register at audubonEverglades.org. So does anybody have any questions related to the group? Okay, so just keep your eye out for our next uh, emails for the next meeting. We've got, I believe, another great presenter. And I'm just really glad that everybody enjoyed this one. So, sure great, great. Great. So time to say good night. Um, it was a pleasure having everybody here. And we'll see you next month. Bye-bye. Right, thanks so much. Thank you.